So to start the season, one of the biggest surprises has to easily be the Cleveland Cavaliers. 13 games into the new year, and Cleveland finds themselves not only at the top of the entire NBA, but also, they haven't lost a game yet. Yes, a 13-0 start to the season not only means that Cleveland could potentially be a legitimate title contender as the year progresses, but also this is one of the best starts to the season that we've seen from any team in NBA history. And what I found even more interesting is that this isn't a team that was just solely depending on their defense like they have been over the past two seasons. Offensively is where the improvement has been monumental as the Cavs had the second best offense in the NBA and really really close to the Boston Celtics a fringe top five defense and a net rating that is also second in the league as well and because of these numbers it really made me wonder why exactly are the Cleveland Cavaliers so dominant and when exactly are they going to lose their first game now this first thing I want to say I know for a fact many of you all are going to be upset me with but please please bear with me for a second the first reason why is because the strength of schedule it's fairly easy. I know, I know, I know. How dare I just completely diminish what the Cavaliers are doing? I just don't want to overreact to a very small sample size that, in all honesty, could just be chalked up to a very easy schedule. And when you're in the Eastern Conference where there's only three teams that are above 500, you're one of those teams. And the other team is the Orlando Magic, who are missing their best player, and they're only one game above 500. <laughs> You're going to have a lot of easy games, and they just so happen to have a schedule that is front-loaded with a lot of really bad teams. To be fair to Cleveland, though, they have been able to beat some competent teams that are out in the Western Conference. They beat the Warriors, the Lakers, and even the Knicks, so they do have some really good wins under their belt, and those are the games I started to watch a little bit more to get a better understanding of what exactly they do really, really well, but it is undeniable when you have a schedule that is this week, it's a bit easier to win games. The second reason why is because the best ability is availability. As corny and cheesy as that sounds, the truth of the matter is a huge Huge reason why Cleveland was not able to exceed the threshold of 50 wins is simply because their core four wasn't able to build enough reps alongside one another that could have translated into more wins. Last year, Donovan Mitchell only played 55 games, Garland 57, and Evan Mobley 50. And even though Jared Allen did play 77 throughout the regular season, by the time we got into the postseason, even he missed some of those important games as well. And so because of the amount of time that was missed with their core four, they only were able to play 28 games alongside one another last season. And so now here we are today, 13 games to the regular season, and we're basically at the halfway mark of how many games they played just last year alongside one another. And this is huge for a core of players that have just recently been pieced together, especially for the young players in Garland and Mobley who are still trying to figure it out and make some natural progressions, which is something that we're really starting to see early on this season. And even though this is a very simple approach to what exactly is going on in Cleveland, it's all very important because of how these four players interact with one another. Essentially, if you stagger the minutes correctly, you can effectively have a lob threat and a dynamic ball handler on the floor every single minute throughout the game. To be fair to J.D. Bickerstaff, he attempted to do this last year, but again, when you're not available, you can't do this. But now, giving new head coach Kenny Atkinson that type of firepower, which is an identity that he has been thriving with for years now, dating all the way back to when he was a coach for the Brooklyn Nets, of course, you're going to yield really, really, really good results. Now, how exactly do they do this? I'm going to be honest with you, and I'm trying to be as in-depth as possible, but bro, the Cavs, they just they, they just can't miss right now. <laughs> They're making a lot, and I do mean a lot of shots. Now, I promise I'm not trying to simplify this. And yes, there are new developing folds in this offense that is certainly benefiting certain players, in particular Evan Mobley, who the Cavaliers are just much more liberal with his ability to handle and initiate offense. A big reason why they do this is to make sure they can get as much spacing as possible by initiating initiating offense with him at the top of the key rather than at the post or at the elbow. Atkinson has picked up a lot of these sets within his time in Golden State coaching alongside Steve Kerr and with Draymond Green, and you can clearly see a lot of those Kevin Garnett comps that many people gave to Mobley early on in the season are on full effect. He seems much more comfortable, much more versatile, and just way more confident in his ability to get downhill, especially when teams are giving him space to do so, and he's making proper reads. I do love the inverted pick and rolls as well to give someone like Donovan Mitchell and Darius Garland easy looks at the basket, but more importantly, it does force a lot of teams to just switch because that's what teams are attempting to do defensively pretty often, and doing so, it just puts a smaller defender on Mobley to get to the basket at will. But that's not the biggest aspect of their offense. It is without a doubt very heavily predicated on a lot of pick and rolls, lob threats, and just really great shot making from two players that are hitting shots at a very high clip right now. So when I was watching these games, I was like, man, it just feels like the Cavs are just making threes at a crazy rate. It just feels like there are like three or four players on the floor that are constantly making threes at like a 40 to near 50% clip. And I was right. The Cavaliers lead the league 
in three point accuracy at 41%. And even though they don't attempt that many threes, because how accurate they are, it just feels like an avalanche. And in particular, Donovan Mitchell, Darius Garland, Karis LeVert, Isaac Okoro, and Ty Jerome all make their threes at a 40% clip or higher. And again, when you're watching these games, it certainly feels that way as well. It just feels like there's an avalanche of three-point shooting that is just bombarding any team in the NBA. And when they're hot, they are hot, and it's practically impossible to keep up with them. The Warriors saw this firsthand. After the first half, the Cavs shot 63% from behind the arc, making 14 threes in just two quarters. And Ty Jerome couldn't literally miss a three. He was perfect from the field. So, and what's even scarier is that there's certain players on this team that are really good three-point shooters that have just started the season very slow, like Gordon Yang and also Dean Wade. They could easily start making their threes at a higher clip, and that will be even more players that are shooting at a ridiculously high accuracy. Another huge part of the equation is Darius Garland. Not gonna hold you, Garland right now is amazing. He's not averaging a ridiculous amount of points. He's actually only averaging 20 points per game. He's getting around six and a half assists which his passing and playmaking has always been there but it's even more improved when you have the level of floor spacing that is constantly surrounding him in particular though the shooting splits are just ridiculous 53 percent from the field 45 percent from behind the arc and 89 percent from the charity strike these numbers across the board were even better early on in the season he's had a couple of games that have been a bit hit or miss at least in contrast to what he did early on but when i say he's making shots at an abnormal rate he's making shots at an abnormal rate it's actually very very, very impressive. The one thing that's really stood out to me while I was watching his games is that his floater is just impeccable right now. Every single time Garland got within that in-between game and just put some up, a put shot, a floater, it was going in at a really high clip. Bro, according to Second Spectrum, Garland is making his floaters at, at about a 75% clip. 75%. Now to be completely transparent, tracking numbers aren't always accurate because the definition or how you define a floater in contrast from one player to another certainly goes up in the air. But when you're watching Garland, it certainly feels like that in-between game, he is making those at a very, very high clip, which is a great development for who he is as a player on a team that at times deals with spacing issues because a lot of defenses are willing to concede that tough layup, that tough floater to any ball handler in the NBA. But when you're making them at this clip, it does start to play a really good cat and mouse game between Garland and defender when he's coming off of a screen that the Cavs are winning at this point at a really, really high rate. And in my opinion, that is probably the biggest difference maker with the team offensively the more involved Evan Mobley with the much needed improvement of Darius Garland has really put this team over the top and again this goes back to the ability to kind of just stagger minutes and so even though yes Kenny Atkinson and his coaching staff does have to be a little bit more creative when all four of them are on the floor because Evan Mobley and Allen they do muck up the spacing a little bit a lot of this kind of just results into a lot of transition points which is a sidebar again when I was watching these games I was like bro they get out of transition and they get it up they just run 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 because they know in a half court set they're probably not going to get the greatest look when Mobley and Allen are on the floor even though this offense is very creative and so because they just love to run in transition however when they get out in transition bro they're making those shots also at a really really high clip and I went to go look at the numbers and it all translates as well the Cavaliers are arguably the best transition team in the NBA and in particular with Donovan Mitchell and Darius Garland those two are converting their transition possessions at a rate that is similar to Giannis right now it's crazy and so when you pair all of this improvement more involvement creativity with the offense with the excellence of donovan mitchell who is just one of the best tough shot makers in the nba as well as jared allen who is one of the best lob threats in the nba and an improved bench in particular with karis lavert who has been revitalized under kenny atkinson once more and three-point shooting across the board that is much needed especially with isaac okoro the offense is just flowing at a level in which i don't think too many people anticipate it and then on the defensive side of the floor bro they're still great like isaac okoro because now he's shooting at a 40% clip from deep. He plays more minutes. He's a very impactful POA. He's really good off ball as well. Just constantly having two, not one, but two really good rim protectors on the floor all the time is amazing. And the one thing that I really do love about both Allen and Mobley on the defensive side of the floor is that they've already established themselves as a certain type of defender, but they don't really get the true credit on how versatile they are on that side of the floor. Mobley is praised constantly for his versatility, switchability, and how mobile he is in open space in particular with his ability to kind of roam around but this year there certainly seems to be a bit more attention to detail when it comes to rim protection and post play that is translated to him being slightly improved in those regards and then jared allen who in my opinion I, I think is really underrated and i think a lot of people just don't give him credit for what he does because how much they may lust over mobley's defense but 
but Jared Allen, the better rim protector, the better rebounder, the better post defender. But I've seen Allen in space this year. He's really, really good, moves his feet. And when players are driving to the basket, he rides their hips just as good as any wing in the NBA. He's actually really, really good. I have to give a lot of credit to Jared Allen. I did not know that he was that smooth and very mobile in space. I did not believe that at all. So when you have a really good defined defense, as well as an offense with a slight bit of more creativity and the availability of your four best players, and also a very weak schedule, it's not the biggest surprise that the Cavaliers are starting off the season 13 and 0. But the biggest question I'm pretty sure many of you all are wondering, when are they going to lose? They have some pretty tough teams, but I'm gonna be honest with y'all, they, they could come close to beating the Warriors record they set in 2016. 24 and 0 is very impressive. I had to say it's very, very impressive. But looking at this schedule, they can skate around a team or two. They can get, they can get really, really close. I don't know if they're gonna beat it, but they can get really, really close. I'm recording this video right after they got done beating the Philadelphia 76ers. Their next two games, Chicago Bulls, Charlotte Hornets. Bulls, Hornets, feisty teams, especially Chicago. A lot of talent on that roster going underneath the radar. But these are two teams that should lose, especially Charlotte. They don't have the size, don't have the defense to really compete with them. I think that they're gonna be able to win those two games as well then we get to the matchup that everybody wants to know boston at td gardens so an away game against the defending champion boston celtics this is where things are going to be very very interesting but that is the game that i do believe that they should lose it's not only against the defending champions but it's also away but if they do win that game though boy are we on a treat right now because after that they have a beat up new orleans team the toronto raptors atlanta twice and then boston one more time but this time it's going to be at home then after that you have the washington wizards then the denver nuggets which is going to be another difficult one at Charlotte, at Miami, Milwaukee again, which no one doesn't really believe in Milwaukee. I saw the Philadelphia 76ers game and I got a little worried. However, this Sixers game on the 21st is a back-to-back. -back, so potentially Paul George and Joel Embiid are going to be out those games. So that should be another easy win. And then they finally wrap up on December 23rd against the Utah Jazz. This will bring us to 28 games into the regular season. And the reason why I stopped there is because after that game against Utah is when they go make their West Coast run and they match up with the Denver Nuggets, Golden State Warriors, Los Angeles Lakers, and Dallas Mavericks all the way. I would assume that they will end up losing one of those games if they have not lost already. But as you can clearly see, hypothetically speaking, even if they lose both Boston games and the Nuggets game, there is a real likelihood that the Cleveland Cavaliers could start the season off with a 25 and three record. And, that, and that's with them losing the games that we all believe that they should lose, which at that point, it does certainly beg the question on if Cleveland is a legitimate title contending team or not. But I'm gonna be honest with you. I don't think they're gonna run off 28 games in a row, not just because they have to face the Celtics twice, but I mean, a bad shooting night, not giving enough effort, you know, it's, it's, it's a long season, right? So something can happen. Uh, uh, on the opposing team, they can be on a burner. They can be just shooting crazy. So things can happen. They can lose games fairly easy right i wouldn't be surprised that even if they don't start off 28 and 0 25 and 3 is very realistic but hey those are just my thoughts let me know in the comment section below how many games in a row do you think the cleveland cavaliers are going to win might even do a giveaway to be honest with you because this right here this is a very interesting story if you get it right i might give you a shout out give you a little something something on the side you know what i'm saying I might, I, might, I might just do that but make sure you hit the subscribe button notification bell so when that does happen you'll be updated on this channel and until next time i'll see you all later peace